one of the common strains that we see in uh, these revolutions, whether they be the French, Russian, uh, Chinese, is that enemy number one is the Christian church. Right. Why is it necessary for revolutionaries to take out... We might say there's two number one enemies, the church and the family. You already mentioned mm-hmm. the family. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're related, right? Why, why is that necessary? Well, because... The idea is that God is the ultimate tyrant. God is the ultimate authority figure. And God is the one who says no to certain things and demands obedience and sets up structures for human life. Mm. And all that has to be torn down. So these revolutionary movements claim to be the way of salvation on earth. It's a counterfeit salvation. It's regeneration through revolution, basically. Mm. So we can't have any other agent of regeneration around competing for allegiance. And as you mentioned, the Judeo-Christian perspective supports the traditional family, uh, not just as one option among many, but in fact, marriage simply is heterosexual. And the pattern of marriage that God himself set up is heterosexual monogamy and faithfulness within that. But with the sexual revolution, well, that's repressive because the most important thing about us is our sexual expression. It's our eroticism. And this is what Malcolm Muggeridge, what, 40, 50 years ago called erotomania. Mm. And that's exactly what we're seeing. Mm. You know, the eros untethered from moral authority or constraint or any kind of structure And it produces a deep ugliness Mm -hmm. in society. So if you can't shut down the churches or convince people to be atheists, then try to win them over and show them that Christianity actually is Mm pro-LGBTQ. And the liberal churches are literally flying the flag of the LGBTQ plus movement over and over again. And I'm so sad, even... uh, some people that I worked with at my institution who I thought were solid went out into ministry and are now LGBTQ affirming in their, in their ministries. Mm-hmm. And you cannot read the Bible that, re- that way correctly. You simply can't. No. Yeah, one of the things that Francis Schaeffer wrote about in uh, his small book, A Christian Manifesto, was that whenever we remove the God who is there, uh, and who grounds objective truth and morality. Where we lose that, well, then inevitably, whenever people look for, well, then where's truth that I can base my life upon? Where is a system of values that I can know that, that give me direction in life? Mm-hmm. Uh, what do I look to to give me something meaningful in life? Inevitably, what will happen in a society is that technocrats will rise up who tell the people, here's what is true, here's what is right, and, and mm-hmm. so on. And I think that the reason why the church has to be enemy number one for all these revolutions is because the end goal is always a Leviathan state that is determinative of all meaning and uh, also determinative of of all categories. Mm -hmm. I think that's why um, there's such a big push by these leftist movements today to eliminate any type of category that even uh, comes with an obligation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's a big thing uh, and, and why they want to have, like you were saying, family-friendly drag queen shows because we want to tear down mm-hmm. the categories of gender, right. the categories of family and of community because with these things come various obligations. So if we can remove right. those categories and their corresponding obligations, the only obligation you have left is to the state. Exactly. The state is an ersatz god. And so this ersatz, false, counterfeit God, wants to define reality and enforce its autonomous version of morality. That's what it comes down to. So we've got to understand our Christian worldview. What does the Bible actually teach about God, humanity, sexuality, and society? And be activists, be godly citizens who are involved and concerned to be salt and light in our culture, because... We're losing the last vestiges of the Judeo-Christian ethic in the United States in many ways. Mm. It's very serious. Schaefer was deeply concerned about this in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. 
And it has gotten far worse and very quickly gotten far worse than anything he has imagined. I mean, we have some victories or we have some achievements like the Dobbs decision reversing Roe v. Wade, but that only takes it to a different level of dealing with states that are pro-abortion and dealing with companies that will pay their employees to go to a state that's pro-abortion to get yeah. abortion. So the conflict continues. At least the Supreme Court has now made the, made the right decision about this case, and thank God, and it was so long in coming. But there are a lot of other issues to face in terms of critical race theory, gender ideology, and Christians need to really think through what they believe and why and how it relates to our culture. Because this is no time to coast no. as a Christian. Things are too serious. They're, we're talking about normalizing pedophilia. We're talking about telling little, little white kids that they're intrinsically oppressive to people of color. Or we're disempowering people of color, saying you can't do anything until the white oppressors free you. Mm. <laughs> I, I saw a little video about that years, or just a few days ago, and then many years ago, I remember uh, that being depicted on an album I had. Uh, there was a, a Miles Davis album, and there was this guy in the cover that had a sign, a black guy that had a little button on his, either on his shirt or on his hat that said, free me. I thought, I was 15 when I saw that. I thought, wait a minute, free you? Aren't you in a position where you need to work on that yourself? Are you <laughs> wait for the white people to free you? Mm. Yeah, and so I go back to Robert Woodson, and what about agency or Shelby Steele? What about agency, achievement? hard work, faith, prayer, family, church, why do we have to ask the state to be the thing that frees us constantly? Mm. Now, some things need to change. Obviously, Jim Crow had to be buried, killed and buried. And you've got to try to make things as fair as possible and really empower people uh, in poverty, whatever mm. race they are, and try to encourage them and help them and pray for them. But this idea you've got one group that oppresses, another group that's oppressed, and unless the oppressors do almost all the work, the oppressed are just going to stay oppressed. Well, that's a recipe for underachievement. That's a recipe for failure, depression, and all the rest of it. You know, we're made in the image and likeness of God. The old children's song, you remember that? Jesus loves the little children, red and yellow, black and white, they're precious in his sight. Mm -hmm. Somebody told me, well, that's actually racist because you left out a few colors. <laughs> I mean every color, okay? They're all precious in his sight. Yeah. And we all have potential because we're made in the image and likeness of God, but we're all sinners, so I need to come to Christ for forgiveness and new life. But then we all have the possibility of doing the common good, working for the common good. Mm. And that's never been more significant, I think, than today, given the mass insanity we're seeing in some of these issues and the violence and the threats of violence. I think one of the things that is at the foundation of the controversy is who gets to define what is the common good. Exactly. 